You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Thank you for tuning in. We've had some great guests, and I, I got to tell you, we've got great guests coming up. Um, all I'll say is if you really like the podcast, this little podcast that we're bringing you every week, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying, um, I ask you to follow us and maybe write a review if you want, but most importantly, give the show a chance and um, subscribe. And uh, the Ryan, you can tell them where the, what the handles are. At Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at Inside of You Pod on Twitter. I will not call it X. It is Twitter. I won't either. Yeah. I'm going to call it Twitter. Uh, a lot of things happening in, in the world, but uh, we don't need to bore you with that. Um, what I will say is that, um, well, we're enjoying this podcast and we really appreciate it. And uh, thank, thanks for uh, all the uh, love. And uh, thanks to my patrons uh, for giving back to the show to keep it going. You can go to Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash inside of you if you want to give back to the show uh, at all. And that's Patreon dot com slash inside of you. Also, the Inside of You online store has a bunch of merch, um, Lexmas scripts, and ship keys, and cool stuff like that. Pictures, and and you know they're autographed by me because uh, well, they just are. Also, you can go to my Instagram at the Michael Rosenbaum. Go to my link tree, and you can see my the cons I'm going to, the cameo, uh, all that stuff, all the news. It's all there, and uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, go to Sunspin.com if you want to learn more about the band. There's merch there, and uh, I have a new pet product. It's called Rosie's Puppy Fresh Breath, and you can get it on Amazon, and it's really awesome. It's got the picture of me and my dogs and uh P- rosie's puppy fresh breath and it's it's cool you just put like a little right you just put a little uh dab like in the cap and you put it in the b- dog's water and it, it, the instructions are there that's it and my dog's breath i use it every day and their breath's great I and it's all- odorless it's sm- uh tasteless i was gonna ask you for some the other day <laughs> really uh because i'm watching my sister's dog and it's bad breath no he got into uh some feces on our walk. Oh no! Yeah, because he he's very good. He's a scavenger. Like he like he he'll pick up anything he thinks is food on the ground. And, and then, then the breath just, is just awful. And he just got into some poop. I'll get you one. Yeah, I'll get you one of those. They might need it because he's like, he, if you don't get him fast enough, he'll. It's start, so it's easy, and there's other products out there that do it too. But you know, I like our product, and the label's nice and pretty. And, it is. Nice. Uh, it works. Most importantly, so go to Amazon. It's called Rosie's Puppy Fresh Breath. If you want to write a review, that'd be awesome. Uh, that's up to you. Uh, today we have a guest that ha- was on just about a year ago, and he was so good that I had to have him back on because he's so fun, he's so interesting. His clips went viral. He is a uh, super talented actor and cool, cool dude. Uh, tell all sort of, um, you know, doesn't take much shit from a lot of people, and uh, but he's a big sweetheart. He really is. He's got a heart of gold, and I loved having him on the podcast. And now we've got him back. It's Michael Bean. I think you know Michael Bean. Look him up, for God's sakes. I don't need to give you his credits. They speak for themselves, right, Ryan? Yeah, they really do. They really, (laughs) really do. I wish I had his career. Uh, Let's get inside of my good buddy, Michael Bean. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. What I was saying to you is <laughs> I, had, I had not done very many podcasts before, but I had done Adam Carolla's podcast right. a couple of times years ago. And my son used to produce his show. And um, I don't ever remember people approaching me on the street going, hey, Adam Carolla, fantastic or whatever. But since I've done your show, I've had like... 30 people, 35, 40 people. Just come up to you. They just come up to me and like, I saw you on Rosenbaum's show, man. You're, that was great. Awesome. I you, you know, know? I love that. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm really surprised you have a much bigger following. Uh, Loyal. Than I, well, Loyal following. Well, I I don't know if... Yeah, I'm sure you you know your audience, so I'm sure they're loyal. But uh, yeah, it's it was I, it's been kind of crazy. Yeah, you called me, and I was like, "What?" You know, like people, you know, and it's not only that, but other actors in the industry, colleagues and whatnot, they were they were coming up to me saying, "Dude, your interview with Michael Bean 
that's i mean they that's the go-to they keep coming back to that they like you a lot and they liked what's his name um that you liked what was the older guy robert patrick yeah i like robert and yeah. it was yeah. the same thing it was two guys who were just laying it out there who were real dudes yeah and i think what people got from you and you could tell me about this is james cameron said you are a monster star and you could be a huge major star but you didn't want to do a lot of publicity you didn't like that whole part of the thing you want you were about the work is that true um yeah and i think i alluded to that um yeah you know there's a skill to being able to do the red carpet and uh, go on the morning shows and do that like 60 second clip and all that stuff and uh you know you go shoot the magazines and you're on the cover of magazines and they do stories about you and uh i was just never that comfortable i just was never comfortable doing that stuff and like i told you last time my lifestyle was one in which um you know i didn't you know uh if if people were following me around with cameras uh <laughs> they they would have gotten quite a show back in the day you know really you didn't really talk about that did oh, you i did yeah of course i talked about all my boozing well i know about the I, boozing I, and stuff I, but yeah. like on camera like when people were trying to film you and stuff were you like aggressive no i was uncomfortable well you know if team z jumped out at me i could be uh a, a, a little bit aggressive but um no i was just uncomfortable i just didn't feel you know i'm an actor and i this format is different than somebody just sh coming up, sh shoving a camera in your face and, you know, asking you about your movie or, you know, about something that's going on. And uh, uh, I, I just never very felt very comfortable doing it. There's a difference between being an actor and a movie star. And some people can do it really well. You know, um, Tom Hanks does it really well. And Johnny Depp does it really well. And there's, a, you know, a lot of people that do it really well. Is it the well. nerves? It's kind of, I, yeah, I don't feel comfortable. I just don't feel comfortable. I feel, I love acting. I so feel you never felt comfortable because someone come up, Mr. Bean, can no, we get an interview with no, you? Can we? No, You're like, no, thanks. No. Well, you know, it's not like I, you know, sometimes you're, you have to do press for a yeah. movie. You have to, you know, you have to be there to do press. They yeah, what do they call it? The, junkets and whatnot? Yeah, press well, junkets? Done, oh, yeah, I've done plenty of junkets. And you, those don't make you feel comfortable. No, I've never felt comfortable doing that. Because you think what? Is it? Is it the bullshit? Is it the sort of surface crap? It's just a natural thing. I don't. I don't feel, um, I don't feel like myself, you know, I don't mm -hmm. feel like this is, you know, all, and I feel like I've got to like, oh, I've got to promote the movie and, you know, fuck all that shit. You but know? Almost and, I, and, I, and I, and I, you know, you, you were asking me before and I didn't articulate it as well as I could have. Is I've never thought about being a movie star. I never, my dreams when I came over here were, so minor what were somebody, they what were your dreams if somebody had told if somebody had told me that i could have been in a soap opera for 20 years and gotten paid a hundred thousand dollars a year i would have sold my soul for it at really that. you oh, just absolutely. wanted to act you I, want I you know i you know when i got my screen actors guild car when i got my first like modeling gig when i got my first commercials all of that stuff was like oh my god you know i do a photo shoot for some car company and it would be in playboy magazine and i'd run back and show my parents and stuff like that you know just a just a a modeling job and i was not a runway model you know i was not <laughs> really no no <laughs> i was not um just uh, I, was, I think they call it like a print you know print, yeah. right print model yeah, yeah. i so could see was, I, I could never I was never, I'm not being, you know, self-deprecating. I am, but like, I was never good looking enough to be a model, a print model, magazines. I never booked commercials. I never, I just, I was like an awkward looking kid. So if that was presented to me, I wonder, I wonder what I would have done. But if someone like you, who just doesn't like that stuff in the beginning, when you're modeling and stuff on print, did you feel comfortable doing that? Yeah. Why is that? I, you were I, a part? I wasn't having to talk to anybody, you know. I wasn't having. To, I wasn't promoting anything. Right. I don't know. It was just, just, just yeah, go stand over there, smile, smile bigger. Now start laughing, you oh, know. Pay me. Yeah. Well, and of course they did. And at that time, 
you know, Michael, I was work. I used to work for the May Company a lot, which was they used to run ads in the L.A. Times. And I go down there, they, they were paying me sixty dollars an hour, and I was. This was back in the you know mid seven, early early like seventy three, seventy four, seventy five. That was huge money for me. Huge money for me. I do a couple hours, come home with one hundred and twenty dollars, have to pay my rent. You know, I lived in a I lived in a little box with uh, three other guys, my brother and uh, another friend from uh, Arizona and uh, a guy that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've always, you know, Michael, I've, as I said before, I've always had a really good time. I love this you business. Have. I love this business. I love what it's what's happened it happened my career happened like very very slowly incremental though. yeah but Lee. people think of me like oh you did the terminator well when i did the terminator that you know i was the most experienced person on that on that uh crew you know um because you had done all these other little I, gigs yeah and, and more than little gigs i had done movies and television shows and a television series that you know, didn't go six years, but I had worked a lot by the time. It's amazing I, how much experience you get when you're doing a TV show. You, If you pay attention, you have everything right there that you need to prepare you for the big thing, if that happens. Stan Winston talks about reading the Terminator script and going like, oh my God, I got to do this. I got to do this. Because they originally wanted Dick Smith, who I'd worked with on The Fan. See, I'd already done The Fan. I'd already worked with Lauren Bacall, Robert Stigwood, Hector Elizondo, uh, Griffith and Dunn was Were in there. Were you that. starstruck at all with Lauren Bacall? I was this, uh, yeah, I was a little starstruck, but uh, was she nice? No, she no. wasn't nice. No, she's a very. She, I think she was a very unhappy person. Was she nice to you? No. And how would you deal with that? Um, I was young. I didn't um, care as much. I didn't, you know. Uh, uh, I, no, I, you know, I'm an actor. I don't, you know, I, I don't need her being friendly with me. And you don't plus, need anybody being friendly. We talked about that with Val Kilmer and all these other guys in Tombstone. You're like, I don't give a fuck. You don't want to talk to me. Let's do this part. Let's do it. I'm, but, you know, listen, I have a, you know, I had a, a, a great time, not not only with the other actors, with Powers and with Stephen Lang and with John Corbett and um, all the guys that were cowboys. You know, I had a great time. It wasn't like, okay, we're just going to do this and fuck, fuck the movie. You know, we were, we 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 had a really good time. Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer, they kind of hooked up. Like Sexually? Little, uh, I never asked. <laughs> I, I, I never wanted to yeah, know. Yeah, I don't think that I, happened. I never, yeah. <laughs> I, Goldie was around. Her children were around. Their right. children were around. They were a little, not toddlers, but uh, preteens, right. that, that kind of thing. At the time, what was I talking about? Why do you have Lauren? To I like because my mind me. goes all these places. <laughs> well, you were talking oh, about Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall. You had the experience. You were you were prepared. So when you did this movie, it, you know when you did uh, well, Terminator. Yeah, when I did Terminator, I had I had done a lot of work, yeah. and Jim had uh, done um, the Piranha movie and had been fired off of that. There's some great stories about Jim Cameron over there. Uh, recut it. Yeah, he he used to go into uh, uh, he got fired. Off and, yeah, and he, yeah, and he was. I didn't know that. Yeah, he and he was. Uh, I think it was, it was a, some Italian company, and uh, so after he shot the movie, the Italian guys just thought, okay, we'll take it and we'll cut it, cut it together. And he used to sneak into the cutting room at night, and he used to like recut what they cut. So they'd show up the next morning, and they'd be like, "What you?" You know, like, and so he kept sneaking in and re every day. How do you do that? Well, he brought, yeah, he asked Jim Cameron, but that's that <laughs> for sure is a, a story that's out there. And that uh, uh, Lance Hendrickson told me he was working with Lance Hendrickson, and Jim will tell you too that he was in there. And uh, that's pretty crazy. So he gets fired off this movie. Yes. He's trying to re edit, and then they give him Terminator 2. They didn't give him Terminator 2, he wrote Terminator 2. Okay. He didn't, nobody gave Jim anything. So they Jim, didn't want him to direct it. Well, he has, he was working for Roger Corman's company and he wrote a, you know, he, he wrote this script and, um, uh, uh, Hemdale, uh, John Daly and I forget the name of the other guy, 
And uh, uh, they took it out to all the studios. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. They took it to Orion and a guy named Mike Metavoy was running the company at the time. And uh, he's got a son now that I think is still in the business as manager or agent or something. So he, he, he shopped it around in Orion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, Orion was the only company that was interested in doing it. Inside You is brought to you by Shopify. I don't know what I would do without Shopify. Ryan, Shopify is so easy to use. I have two stores that I have now through Shopify. I have the Inside You online store. I have uh, the Talkville online store. And on Shopify, it's so easy. You just go and go, it says products. And these are your products. Add new product. Hit a button. Add new product. How many sales have you had? Hit the button. Analytics. You see the numbers come in. What's your best seller? Everything is so easy to look at, to use, and adding products. And in, 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 it's just like I never thought it would be this easy. I thought it would be a, a real pain. And you don't have to do much of anything. It keeps track of everything for you. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Yes, and Shopify, Ryan, helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash inside, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash inside now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash inside. Inside of you is brought to you by Wondery. Being a king or queen might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. The creators of Wondery's Even the Rich are bringing you a brand new podcast called Even the Royals, where host Brooke and Arisha pull back the curtain on royal families, past and present from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From stories about one of the most infamous royals in history, Marie Antoinette, but everything you know about her is wrong. After she became queen at just 19 years old, she ended up in a battle with the French press and started a series of impossible-to-believe events. It's history's greatest smear campaign, and it had deadly consequences. Or what might be the worst royal marriage of all time between King George IV and Caroline of Brunswick? It's a story involving catfishing, fake pregnancies, and it all leads to a divorce trial where the whole world sat on the edge of their seats to see how it would all play out. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcast. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. They said if you can get a star to be in it, then, you know, we'll green light it. A star of a certain magnitude, which right. I was not. I had worked a lot, but I wasn't a, a – and still have never really been a movie star. But uh, – and you can you can go online and find out about and, – and listen to Jim and Arnold talk about how they met and – uh how you know they decided that he would play the Terminator, and that freed him up. Now he had his big star because he uh, uh, Arnold was already Mister Universe and been Mister yeah. Universe for like five or six. So he was, uh, and he had done Conan the Barbarian. He had done the first Conan the Barbarian, yep. and uh, you know he he and and so he was a star, but he was not somebody that I, as a young actor, you know, I was like watching De Niro and Pacino and uh, Dustin Hoffman and uh, Warren Beatty right. and Jack Lemmon. Those and, were your uh, guys. Those well, were, yeah, I mean- That's those, who you looked up to, you aspired to be. Yeah, especially De Niro. Right. You know, Taxi Driver changed my life. Tax, the movie Taxi Driver turned me into a different, turned me into 
I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that. Just guy. because of the raw. Oh, it's it's a brilliant movie. Yeah. It's it's the best of the best as far as uh, Scorsese go. He didn't win the Academy Award for that, but he it uh, the score, the the, the all, uh, uh, Jodie Foster. Uh, yeah. But De Niro in it is just stunningly brilliant were you intimidated movie. by his performance or like no i want to do that I no i want to do that i wasn't intimidated by i know i really don't get intimidated by anybody you know there's um, not one actor that you go god man i, I can't do what he does oh there's does. a lot of actors that 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 i can't do what they do but if i'm i never claimed to do that so you know i'm mm -hmm. not intimidated i'm just like okay well i'm me so um, i can do this yeah. and that's you know that's what I do. So I met De Niro once because he used to stay at the Mayflower Hotel in New York City, which is no longer there. And I was there with my uh, wife at the time or girlfriend, wife, my first wife. And uh, where I was at a restaurant and I was sitting there and I was like, ah, fucking Robert De Niro's on oh my God. It's Robert De Niro. Robert <laughs> De Niro's, honey, it's Robert De Niro sitting over there, you know? And I was like, you know, and uh, De Niro looks up and uh, he looks over at my, my table he looks over at me and he goes like this, come on, come on over here. What? I was like, what? I said, honey, that's- did, Had you I, done I, anything I, at this point? Uh, well, yeah, I was doing the fan. Okay. I was shooting the fan okay. at the time and he stayed, he, I think he had like a permanent place at the Mayflower Hotel and I was staying at the Mayflower Hotel and, and but I hadn't seen him around the hotel. This come is the first. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly what. He, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, very good. And uh, I was like, oh my god, you know what? You know what could what Robert is he De Niro? Say to you? You know, what could he possibly say to me? I, I went over there, and he was with like a, 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 a little a, a little group, and uh, two or three guys, and uh, he said. Uh, that girl you I with. knew I it. can't I, I can't do I can't do Who's impressions. That, that girl you with? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that your sister, he says? <laughs> I'm like I'm like, uh, no, Bobby. No, uh, no, I said no, Mr. De Niro. That's that's my wife. And uh oh okay. I get the fuck back to the table. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that was my experience. And then my oh, then my, my wife God. ended up setting him up with one of her girlfriends. And he went out with one of her girlfriends who was from New York, and that didn't go very well. But um, you didn't hang out with him after that, really? No. 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 I've never now, seen him again. Let me ask you this. When Orion, is it Orion yeah. or Orion? Yeah, Orion. Orion. When Orion bought Terminator, when they're casting, was it like, was there, a, like, did James want you? No, yeah, I went in along with uh, probably a lot of other people. I think originally he wanted Sting. Because he thought Sting had this kind of unearthly quality about him. And I think he met with Sting. And I think Sting basically said, uh, yeah, I just watched Piranha too. I think I'll take a pass on this thing, you know. <laughs> um, something along something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how serious Jim was about him. Right. I've never heard any other name associated uh, with Kyle Reese. Right. Um, but, you know, I... Uh, I was doing an. I was actually uh, uh, rehearsing for a play for a guy named Jose Quintero back in the day. It was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and I was re not rehearsing. I was uh, auditioning, but I, I auditioned with like a number of different g women, and um, I was there for six or seven hours auditioning. And then I went and auditioned for Jim and Gail Hurd. And Gail, Gail Hurd doesn't really get the uh, recognition that I think that she deserves because it's you know Jim, Jim, Jim Cameron, Jim Cameron, but. She produced Terminator, Aliens, and and The Abyss. You and, love and, The Abyss. I love The Abyss. Well, The Abyss is uh, The Abyss. I think Jim has uh, described The Abyss. Uh, uh, you know, the first two acts are extraordinary. Well, what happens in that movie is the brilliant scene where Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio and um, uh, Ed Harris are uh, trying to decide the water's rising on them. They're trying to say, you wear the helmet. No, I'll, I'll wear, you, you wear the helmet. You wear the helmet. The water's rising up. They finally decide he's going to wear the helmet, pull her underwater, and then they're going to bring her back to life, which they did. And he's on top of her. Wake up, you bitch. And he's slapping her and all the, it, the, his group is around him. And it's a tremendous film. It's, I mean, a tremendous um, uh, scene. Uh, and it 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 brings the audience and all the characters to a place 
emotionally that he that Jim never achieves with the rest of the movie. So the emotional high for the characters and the emotional high for the uh, uh, the, the the audience happens peaks then peaks at that point. Now does he admit now, to that? Is, Has he said that? Yes, I've heard him say that. He, there's a uh, but this is not even going to be like the old abyss. He when when he was shooting the abyss, he brought me in, and he showed me he had two endings. He had one that was three hours long, and he had one that was a truncated sort of you know version of what the studio wanted him to um, release, and that's what he released. And this is going to be longer, and it's going to have um, more depth. Uh, well, I don't I, you know I don't I don't. I don't know. I, I kind of saw it in a rough cut and, and I I can't tell you. Uh, uh, I Have just, you talked it, to him at all? No, I haven't talked to Jim in uh, four years. You know, he moved to New Zealand. He's in New Zealand now and he's been there for a while. He's not up in, he was up in Malibu for years and years and years. And the last time I was in his offices, it was when I was doing um, uh, Mandalorian. Mandalorian and, and him shoot in the same lot. And, uh, and you so, just went to visit him? Yeah, he was editing. And he was like, yeah, come on in. Yeah. yeah. So if you saw him, it'd be like yesterday. Yeah. With, with, with Jim Cameron, I'm the same person. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. And, and I don't, you know, I don't think Jim Cameron has changed. He's a billionaire now. <laughs> well, but, yeah. uh, but he's always been that guy. Every time you see him do an interview and he's talking about some camera lens or some effect that Just he's passion. done, and you can't even understand. Like when that... That 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 underwater sh thing that went down to the Titanic exploded, uh, imploded. Yeah, that's what happened to me in the abyss. The exact same, you know, like my characters. One of my best death scenes, I think, is my characters like freaking out and the windows crack and and that and that submersible implodes. It doesn't explode. It implodes, yeah. and that's what happened to them. And you know, Jim came out and I heard him talking about that, but. Uh, and Jim was in town a couple of weeks ago announcing this uh, uh, 4K, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> High def. What, yeah. What, There's wait, 5K now, yeah. I believe. Go back to when you were cast. You auditioned for seven hours. Well, no, I was auditioning for uh, Cat on Hot Tin Roof. Oh, so. So it was a lot more material. And I was I was working with different actresses. They were mixing and matching us right. and doing all that kind of stuff. So when I went to do the uh, audition for Jim Cameron, um, I did an audition. They said, thank you very much. I went back and my agent called me and said, uh, they like you. They like you very much. They like your, but they they don't like the fact that you're Southern, that you are you have this regional mm. sort of Southern accent. I'm like, I'm not Southern. What? I. Uh, I'm from Nebraska. I'm. What, what do you? Uh, oh, oh, this is what happened. Roof, yeah, yeah, the thing just kind of followed me to the next audition, which I had just method. rushed to. That's eh, not method. There's nothing. Method is like I don't even know what that was. Uh, Stanislavski. And but you stuff. were so into it that you probably had a little bit of a draw. Something, something was left over, so they said, "Well, bring him back." And let you know because we like him. I brought him back, and I read for him and Gail again, and I got the part. And then, did you um, know you got the part in the room? No, no, that rarely ever. He's happens. like, thank you, thank you very much. You know, not like thank you, thank you very much. Say, like, hey, Mike, all right, Michael. You know, you know, I I don't remember exactly, but Jim has always been very personable with me. All you know, and 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 Gail too, very professional, very. Did he give you personal. a lot of direction in that movie? I don't think I don't remember him. What he does, Michael, is he writes a great script. So you don't he have writes, to. You just, guy, he right. writes great dialogue. Come with me if you want to live. You know, he writes great dialogue. And so uh, if you if you have great dialogue and you cast an actor that you want to say those words, there's not I don't you know, I don't ever remember sit, sitting around discussing character background, you know, like all that. Like, like you're the part happened. when you get in there, you we, you know the part. You're the part. Well, I didn't, you know, I like to do research. If I'm playing a cop, I like to hang around cops. Navy and I do, SEAL. 
I've hung around a bunch of Navy SEALs for that piece of shit. If the script is good, you should Same be- Same with Tombstone. You know, they didn't, you know- It's the, it's the well, bad wait, Let me say something about Tombstone All now, right. because I get so, I'm so effing tired of people asking me if Kurt Russell directed the movie, okay? Kurt Russell did not direct the movie, okay? Kurt Russell was responsible for getting the movie off the ground. I never would have played Johnny Ringo if it wasn't for Kurt Russell. And I told you last time yep. I was here, I love Kurt Russell, and he's a great- great person and i and i and a great movie star um he's a movie star who handles it really well you mm -hmm. know uh but he's he didn't direct the movie no it was directed uh by kind of a, a committee you know we talked about george cosmatos mm, who came him. in to replace kevin jar so kevin jar shoots five weeks they throw all that stuff away and then um uh George Mas George Cosmatos takes over, and he's kind of a visual guy. And we shoot for another month or two, uh, six weeks or something like that. And then they, then they, then then they they go into post. And when you go into post, you you know you edit the movie. It was edited by a good good editor, but uh, I know that Kurt immediately right after that movie went on to do a movie called stargate that they made the mm -hmm. television series out of right so they, they they did stargate and he because i went to visit him on the set like a week after we wrapped the movie and he was already doing stargate but watch him and anybody watch kurt russell in in, in stargate and he's so grumpy and angry is that, that from tombstone I, the residual you know, effect i you know it's that's the way that i you know when i saw the movie i thought like i've never seen him so grumpy before you did know did you not but, remember him being grumpy on the set of tombstone oh, oh he was no he was never on no no he's fun he was like like i said he's got a great laugh he has a lot of fun uh but what i was saying to you before is like him and val kind of bonded so right. it was him and Val that, that they kind of used to hang out too. Right. Know? So, you know, that that happens on movies. Um, but you said but he didn't direct it. He didn't direct it. It was directed by committee. I mean, it was a great So script. everybody had a hand in like vision and stuff. Everybody had a hand in it. But, you know, a lot of the stuff got cut out of the movie uh, before we got a chance to shoot it. Well, here it is. I'll be able to find it now. Ooh, I like the glasses. Yeah. yeah. Well, you good. know, I got... I had some, started having some problems. Well, you're 50, with, with, 60 with my, or, with my oh. eyes. No, yeah. but not looking just like pain. And uh, oh. yeah, I went to my uh, I went to my doctor, and he sent me to an eye guy. And the guy said, like, he looked at me and did all those tests and everything. He goes, oh, you got the Johnny Depp disease. And I was like, you're too good looking. No, he just said you got the Johnny Depp disease. You got to wear sunglass glasses the rest of your life. I'm like, oh. Oh, do it really? Do I have to? He's like, yeah. I and that's, that's what? what I yeah. I don't even know Johnny Depp had a disease where he has to wear sunglasses yeah. all the time. What's I it called? I believe so. The Johnny Depp disease. That's what my JDD. That's what my doctor. The JDDs. That's what my doctor called. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I have the Michael Bean disease. I'm gonna start wearing fucking sunglasses. <laughs> You know, you wear sunglasses at night. It's the only time you get recognized anymore is if I wear sunglasses at night. Well, he must be a movie star or he's Corey Hart. <laughs> I wear my sunglasses at night. I know that you that you saw the movie a long time ago, but for people who know that movie well, um, uh, I'm just fucking around about the glasses. That wasn't true? <laughs> no. Are you kidding me? No. So you don't have a Johnny Depp disease. No, but there's actually, no such thing. Actually, I need. I to, believed it, didn't you, Ryan? Actually, uh, <laughs> fuck you. I think he. I think Johnny Depp does have some sort of disease. I don't know. Call it a disease. You and got affliction. me, dude, oh. and you got the audience. It's gonna be like all over the papers. All right, He's all got right. the Johnny Depp thing. <laughs> You fuck. I totally bought that. I think that. Jack Nicholson had it too, right? Well, I've got some Johnny Depp <laughs> shit that I contracted back in the 80s. <laughs> you're, good. you're a good impressionist. <laughs> Thanks. So anyway, um, there were certain things that got cut from the from, before we had a chance to shoot them. Because when they brought in George Cosmatos and they threw out all of Kevin's uh, footage... They had to condense a 145-page script, which, you know, is two and a half, two, two hours and 45 minutes, yeah. down to something that ended up being 90 minutes long. And if you ask Kurt, Kurt back uh, uh, 10 years ago talked about the fact that he kind of had to hollow out 
his character and uh, uh, to give, you know, a lot of his stuff he had to cut out to make sure that the movie worked. And that everything. made sense in that time. Well, parameter. it made sense to him. I don't really remember it that way. I remember the, the Cowboys getting the fuck kicked out of them on on that <laughs> cut. It was according to Val Kilmer, it was it was Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell who edited what scenes were going to be in the movie and what scenes weren't going to be in the movie. And a guy named John Fosnato or John something where they came in, he was a director, but he kind of came in to piece it all together. Do you uh, believe that? Do you believe, do believe that what? Val and, and Kurt kind of dictated that? And oh, maybe... they did. No, Val said it. I've seen Val is uh uh, I just, it, yeah. Val, so they went in the editing room and and cut the shit down because it was a they bigger had to. fight. They had to. They had to because uh, it was a what it was a long movie. It was going to be a, you know, a, a two and a half hour movie at least. I would it love was, to see that. Well, there's nothing there because they cut the they cut it before we shot it. So it's not gotcha. like there's a bunch of you know. Gotcha. Yeah, yep. it's not like there's a bunch of footage sitting right. someplace else that they didn't cut. They cut. just didn't shoot it. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp, guys. You don't need me to sit here and talk to you about this, but I'm going to. Um, you know how important therapy is. This podcast talks about mental health and well being and and all that other stuff, and it's it's so important to me in my lifestyle now that. It's helped me substantially. I know it's helped millions of other people, and BetterHelp is a huge part of that. Um, it's affordable therapy online where you can change your therapist like that if you don't like them or don't feel like they're the right fit. Um, it's it's so easy to use. You fill out a questionnaire that takes barely any time, and you're ready to go. And it's the new year. So if you've got things, we've got things we need to talk about, um, BetterHelp is is there ryan around new year's right we get obsessed on how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right i i do it i write a new year's resolution i write all these things and you know maybe you finally organized one part of your space and you want to tackle another or maybe you're you're taking your supplements every morning right now you want to actually eat breakfast too whatever your goals are for the new year therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. I'm telling you, when I stick to therapy, it's better. It's life is better. And what happens is I used to do this where oh, I'm feeling good now. I don't need therapy. It's like not changing your oil every couple of months or it's not, not. These are necessities that if you stop doing something. It's going to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it's just really important. Look, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Even if you've added some new routines in there, just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Why wait for a new year when you can celebrate you and the changes you've already made right now? Therapy from BetterHelp can get you there and help you love you. Love the journey. Love this new year. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. So Ringo. Uh, you. You know, yeah, me. Uh, the only time you ever see the Cowboys is when they're with the Earps. All right. That was not like the script at all. OK. There was a bunch of Cowboys stuff. Uh, that kind of evened it out a little bit more. And one of the, um, this is a scene that was in the original script that um, that is Ringo. And this is after uh, Curly Bill Brocious has been killed. Powers Booth has been killed. Right. And so I take over. That's kind of like uh, set up earlier. God knows what's, what's going to happen when Johnny Ringo takes over this group. So I'm taking over. And one of the cowboys uh, who was at the scene where Curly Bill is killed was talk talks is talk about Wyatt, talk, talk about Wyatt Earp, right? Right. And uh, uh, like, oh my God, he was just you know shooting. The bullets were missing him. And if you know the movie, yeah, people will know what I'm talking about. And uh, people love that movie. And and so Ringo says to him, he's just a man. And the cowboy says to me. You didn't see his face. 
And Ringo says, you see my face, don't you? Everybody, get this through their heads. Wyatt Earp dies. I'm running the show now, and I'm telling you, Earp dies. His men, too. They all die. Understand? We're going to kill them. You hear me? For what they did to Curly Bill, we're going to ride him into the ground and slaughter him like rabbits. Because this is my time, children. This is my time to get wooly. And I cut that fucker out before I shot it. How pissed were you? Eh, I was too busy uh, servicing the Earp wives. Dude, that, that, was, movie. <laughs> that was awesome. I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> Dude, I wanted more of your character. I really did. I mean, it was like the thing that sold me was that gun thing, which we talked about in the last one. But it's like, you know, when you do that thing in front of Val and like, you know, and you, I'm like, oh, this guy's bigger than life, larger than life. And he believes it. He believes that he's larger than life, that he's better than everybody else. That of he's, course. But that that's badass. I'd be like, fuck you. Let well, me you at know, least do it. You know, when you're an actor and you get a script and you go like, okay, well, this is a great scene. This is a great scene. Oh, this, this is the best scene in the movie. That was the best scene in the movie for Johnny Ringo. I never got to shoot Did it. Did you learn the lines? Uh, no. Like I said, I was too busy servicing the Earp wise to pay much attention to what was, <laughs> what was going on. Oh, my God. You know what's funny is like in the very beginning of this conversation we're talking about... You're like, I never wanted to be a movie star. I, you know, you got Tom Hanks. You I loved that. acting. I wanted to act. But you know, you're the only person that's been, that's has said that, that I believe. I actually believe that uh, you didn't want to. fucking believe it. <laughs> no, I do. I do believe from the, the passion, the conviction. I see I that. never thought, I never dreamt I would be a movie star. I never, dr you I know, did. my, dr what? I did. You did, and a lot of people do. A lot of people think, "Yeah, oh, you know, I knew, I knew what, by the time I was six what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a movie." Now, I, I just, I was just looking. You know, I was looking to uh, uh, pay my bills always, and and I ran into Jim Cameron, and I was lucky enough to do a really good audition for Jim Cameron, which led to Aliens, which led to The Abyss, which then leads to offers on Tombstone, and uh, I did a, I almost, made, I mentioned the last time I was here, from the time I auditioned for Jim Cameron, the next time I auditioned and got a job was a movie called Clock Stoppers, at, uh, and you've had the guy on who directed it, I can't think of his name at the moment, the guy from Star Wars, um, uh, not, I'm not Star Trek, Star I mean, Trek. John, John, Jonathan uh, Franks, Jonathan Franks yeah. directed it. It's a good little movie, but he's for a great guy, isn't he? Oh, I love him. Loved him. Love him. Loved him. Love him. I absolutely But that was the him. first audition you had. And what year was that? That was, that, that, that was, there were 17 years between the time that I auditioned for the Terminator and, and the time that I did audition for Clock Stoppers because my career was going So right it was downhill. offer only though. Se offer only. Yeah. But I did go in for a few things in audition and, and I didn't get, and, um, uh, uh so uh, did you audition for james cameron after the first time no never again well you know i replaced james remar on yeah on we didn't a. really talk about that did we no but you know it's out there it's out there but uh, long story short james remar kind of flew into england or whatever for the movie and then he, he got busted for drugs yes and they fired him off the movie. Yes. And they'd already been shooting. They'd been shooting for about a week. And uh, they found drugs in his hotel room in England, wanted him uh, out of out of the country. And I was at home and I was aware of the movie. But, you know, I knew that that, that he was doing it. He was close to Walter Hill because he did the Warriors. Warriors. And so, um, and he's a nice guy. I love guy. the Warriors. Um, so... Yeah, I got a call on Thursday or Friday from from Gail Hurd, and she said, "Michael, we're uh, we're replacing uh, Remar. Can you come over here and and, and play the role of Hicks?" I, I didn't have to think about that for any longer than about a split second before I, you know, said yes. And I was, you know, I got on a plane. They gave me got 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 me the script. I got on a plane. I was in the set Monday morning. You film Monday. Monday morning. Yeah. Were you nervous? Fuck no. I'd worked. I'd worked. I see. I'd worked with Jim before. First of all, Hicks d doesn't have that much to say. The guy in the Terminator so is just cool. like he's got all the exposition. Right, right. Who the Terminator is. Who the uh, who she is. What her future is. Who I am. You know, uh, like I've got all the exposition, and James Cameron's 
smart enough to put all that exposition in all these car chases and stuff. So it, it, it works. But if you look at Hicks, ah, he's sleep half the time, you know, he's, you know, he says a word here and a word there. And I came in and I had already been working with Jim and I had already worked with Gail and I'd done by that time, I knew Bill Paxton very right. well. We talked about Bill Paxton yes, before and Bill and I were very close back then. Uh, and that was right after he met Louise, but we were, we, we had a great time over there, but we were still seeing each other all the time and our careers weren't taking us. So you off were comfortable paths. already on that set. Very, pretty comfortable. Yeah. Was there anyone on that set? And Sigourney is great too. Sigourney and Sigourney yeah. loved you, right? She praised your performance. Yeah, I mean, you she were, has. Yeah, like that's a, that's a performance that's so you play it with such ease and like sensitivity and such likability. It's one of those roles that I always I look at. I'm like, I love this guy. I want to be this guy. This guy's the fucking coolest. And and you know, watching that. Do you? St when's the last time? Are you one that watches the movies you're in yes. maybe after? Do you watch them later on, years later? Yes. You do? I, yes. When's the last time you saw Aliens? Oh, uh, I haven't. I, I've seen parts of Aliens probably in the last six months, but I've seen Aliens. Aliens is the best movie I've ever been in, without a doubt. Aliens is the best movie. Did you and, think it would be? Well, we had high hopes because Jim had done The Terminator and uh, the sets were incredible. And you know a good script when you see one. So, yes, did we have high hopes? We had like, yeah, very, very high hopes. But you never know. There's a great book called The Devil's Candy about making Bonfire of the Vanities and how they thought they had something so special back then. And uh, Bruce Willis and they fired Morgan Freeman off of it. That's how great they thought this thing was and they thought it was great you know and but everybody's invested in it you know the actors are invested the directors invested the crews invested the producers are invested the studios invested so everybody's you know invested in it and they all thought they had the best movie you know going academy awards right down the line and it came out people hated it it's terrible, and it's a great book called uh, uh, Dirty Candy. So you never really know if a if a movie is going to be uh, well regarded, successful until you put it in front of an audience. Last time I was here, I uh, I told you that I had done a couple shows uh, last year. Uh, one was in Australia, and one was in Thailand. And uh, the one I did in Australia. Is I, I described it as a monster movie, okay? And I, about a year and a half ago, uh, I got a call and I got an offer for uh, a job. And um, I, I, it was, you know, a decent enough offer that I needed to, to read it. And so I read, read enough of it to know whether it was going to be any good or not. It had a really funky title. It was called Zombaroo. Zombaroo. I, I have a feeling zombies are in this movie. Yeah. Okay. I'm, and, I'm smart. And, and Zombaroo shot in Australia. Kangaroo and there zombies. You go. There you go. Okay. okay. So I looked at the title. I was like, ah, oh, fuck this shit. Sharknado, you know, blah, blah, blah. Zombaroo. Yeah. Ridiculous, right? So I started reading the script and I fucking sat down. I read the script in one sitting. I'm like, that, this, this script has got good structure. This script, this, and the character I liked. The character I liked a lot. The whole thing needed some work, but I thought like, well, it's kind of good. So I I read it again, and I read it again, and I um, thought like, it's a good script. So um, I told them I was interested. I started getting into contact with the filmmaker, uh, Ryan, and his partner, Richard, and Judd was the producer, and we... Um, you know, we started working on the script. We started working on the script. And I'm good at that. I'm very, very, very good at helping it. filmmakers make scenes better, make characters better, make things make more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, bullshit meter, you know, like like that doesn't work. This doesn't make sense. Want you? And they, here's the thing. And this is what, here's the thing is Richard and Ryan, who were partners uh, and they wrote the script together. They listened to me. 
they didn't hold on to their script like it was gold or something. Most people they, do that. They're they like, do. fuck this guy, I don't want to deal with it. Yes, he absolutely. That's what happened to me in Thailand. They told me in, in, in Thailand, oh, well, uh, uh, we're very interested in being collaborative as far as the script and they goes. they weren't. And I went over there and they, you know, um, they they just weren't. But they, these they, guys did. These guys did. And so they listened to me a lot. So I was really able to create the character that I, and it was, like I said, it was a pretty good script. And first of all, I said, you got to change the title. I mean, unless you want to do Sharknado, you know, you can't call it Zombaroo. Did they? That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's called The Red, which is about- Much better. Yeah, it's about, well, The Red is the biggest uh, kangaroo, kangaroo in Australia. Vicious. So they get to be about six, seven feet, six, five or six feet anyway. Right. And you know, kangaroos, if you Google nasty looking kangaroos, just ones that aren't even in movies, they're they're- Fucking some nasty looking kangaroos oh, who yeah. stare right at you. They're all buff. They're all, they look like they've been lifting weights. And I think they get wired. chlamydia or is that koalas? Koalas. koalas that's yeah. koalas. Anyway, but yeah. they, so anyway, we, you know, we started uh, talking about it and uh, they, 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 sh they were going to shoot it on location in Australia. They put an Australian uh, uh, crew together in a cast and uh, then some like torrential rains hit it, you know, and it, it got, pushed back and i was in australia at that point that's why i went to go do the thing in thailand i went to do the thing in thailand and i came back to do this and um but you know i think they lost a lot of their but a lot of the budget sure. was lost because you know these these rains hit and they, they had it all cast and everything and then they had to turn around and recast it and um so anyway you finished uh, michael, the movie well, yeah yeah we did the movie but michael it 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 was so, by the time that we were shooting it, the budget was so small. I mean, this is a monster where you could have spent $20 million on it, okay? Um, the budget was minuscule. I mean, minuscule. There are times that you would look at the lunch table, you know, at night. We shoot a lot at night, and there would be the director, his partner, Richard, the writer, uh, talking to him about shots they needed to get the, a DP. His name is uh, uh, Bland. Wow. I think of his first name. And I called. Well, I started calling him Blonde. Blondie. I thought his name was Blonde, and then I started calling him Blondie, and then I was started I started going, Blondie. <laughs> you know, from the uh, Clint Eastwood movies. So, uh, but because, there's but, only a few people at this table. Uh, at lunch. Yeah, yeah he, like seven. And you're used to, I mean, you've done huge. No, motion. listen, listen, when I did, I did uh, earlier this year before the writers went out, I did a law and order right? and worked uh, uh, with Maloney, uh, Christopher Maloney. Yeah. He's, he's awesome, by the way. What a horse he is. What a, what a, you know, he has that 40, 40 Teamsters on that show. Okay. 40 Teamsters <laughs> are working on that show. Yeah. We had like. You know, we had uh, the guy, the DP shot it himself, and it was just him. No gaffer? Uh, maybe kind a, maybe of, a little people, lighting. Kind of, yeah. But there not a lot of crew. Somebody Skeleton holding one crew. of the screen. No, no, it doesn't seem like there were any lights out there. They would just hold up screens. And it wasn't and, frustrating to you? No, man. I had a great character. I, you know, Good it was you. like, it was a great, fun character. Crazy, crazier than a fucking loon um but you know i'm good at crazy but yeah. usually the yeah. crazy people that i play are they're bad also right and they want to kill somebody or they want to you know johnny ringo the guy who played the fan like all of those every bad guy i've ever played is a psychopath this guy's like a vietnam vet who's just like fucking lost it but it's he's crazy uh in 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 a fun kind of way and he's the one who originally knows what's going on with this creature and comes running into town. Oh my God, I've seen it. I've seen it. You know, we're all in mortal danger. And they're like, oh, it's Schmitty. You know, the character's name is Schmitty. Oh, it's Schmitty again. You know, like, right. okay, Schmitty, you saw a big kangaroo and yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Flashbacks are you, buddy? Uh, yeah, exactly. And then somebody else gets killed. Uh, no, then, then somebody... Two uh, miners get killed, and then a young boy gets killed. Well, don't give people, the whole thing away. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. But here's the thing about it, Michael, that I learned because um, I'm a producer on the show on 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 it, and 
um, you know, I saw the rough cut and, you know, I felt pretty good about the rough cut, but rough cuts are hard to watch because it doesn't have mm. the music. It doesn't have the sound the design. Nothing. It doesn't, it's like, yeah, they're really very, very hard really to tough. watch. So anyway, they sent me the movie a couple of days ago and, uh, uh, it's unbelievable how good a little tiny movie it can be. And I don't mean tiny like it's shot in one room. It's shot in Australia. We shot it in the bush, you know. But a low-budgeted movie Way, in the middle dude, of nowhere. Dude, yeah, dude, it's a really low-budget movie, and the crew never seemed to be more than about 10 people. Uh, and But they surrounded me with um, three, or, three or four really, really good Actors and actresses and actors and actresses know good scripts when they see them and they, you know, and that's why they're in it. You know, that's there's awesome. a, the, the one, there's a woman who's the star of it is kind of has to take, and I think her last name is pronounced Harbaugh, uh, uh, Tess is her name. And she's really, really good in it. Very, very when good. When does it come it, out? It, it looks great. Um, they are, uh, right now they are, uh, they, we, what, you know, um, festivals. No, we, no? they're, no, we're, uh, talking to uh, a company, uh, called Shudder, which is. I love Shudder. I own okay. Shudder. Okay. Well, I watch you... all my horror movies there. All right. Well, they're, they're, we're negotiating. Why don't we do a screening at my house? Well, okay. You know, I, Dude, mean, I love that shit. Well, yeah. Well, you'll love You gotta it. let me know. You'll, you'll, I'll okay. love it. Inside of you is brought to you by Discover. If you like using debit over credit, don't you think it's time you also get rewarded? Well, now you can with Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cash back on everyday purchases. Plus, there are no fees, period. We're talking date nights, thrifting the latest trends, nights out with your friends, and it's now earning you cash back with Discover Cashback Debit. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. It looks great. It This camera guy, Blonde, this uh, Chris Bland is his name, it is unbelievable looks great. what he did. They shot it with one camera. And it's it looks a like film. Movie. Oh, it does not look, there's not one shot in it that looks low budget. It's well acted. That's just unbelievable. Um, it's it's got a good soundtrack. It's well edited. And it's short because th these days you don't need to make a, you know, because of uh, the streaming services, you can make an 88 minute movie. Oh, yeah. So 70. It, yeah. Well, you, you can. I think this is 88. But you're critical. You're, you seem like the kind of guy that if it was a piece of shit, be like, it's a piece of shit. Don't see it. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't you even promote wouldn't be it. Talking. You to no, the fact I'm, that I'm promoting this and because it, you it, really like this. I like it and I like it. And it's people don't realize when they're going to see a movie that some are made for a million and some are made for a hundred million. hundred million. Yeah. And usually and, they suck. Uh, well, no um, hard. Uh, I think the, uh, the Avengers had problems this weekend this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I've showed it to a couple of friends of mine that, that kind of like about it is there's, yeah, there's some CGI because the monsters sure. CGI, but you can tell we're in the bush. We're out there. We're sweating. It's dirty. It's, you know, um, and um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to talk it up too much. Like I said, the budget on it is very, very, very minimal. You know, that's, it's funny because my friend Bill, who's helped me out today, who's one of my good friends, he wrote this awesome movie, uh, Let Them Die. And it's a great script. And he's, I've seen some of his like short films. It's amazing. And I'm like, and we want to make this thing. And it's a movie like that. That's just, we could do this low budget and really make this movie great. And I believe in him. And so it's one of those things where you believe in a young filmmaker that didn't have a lot of money, but you saw something in there. You worked on the script. It was collaborative. They allowed you to, it was yes. malleable. Yes. And ultimately you not only had a great time and a great working relationship, but you liked the movie as well. Yes. That's, that's a rare thing. It is. But rare. I commend you for like taking these guys under your wing in a way and like using your expertise and your talent and your like notoriety or whatever. I couldn't have done it if they wouldn't let me do it. 
And it, most exactly. people- It's like, ego, I, ego. No, you, I know what I'm doing. Yes. I'm not gonna like, right. if you want oh, some- Oh, you've only been doing this for 50 years? You know, I don't, you know, I don't think that you know what you're talking about. You know, it's what I had right. the, the, the other one I did in Thailand. It's just like, yeah, we're not interested in what you have yeah, to say about- Yeah, you're not promoting that. Yeah. No, oh, I haven't seen it. Okay, wait, wait till you see it. You know. Let me ask you this. And listen, when I do a show like that, I'm still committed, and, but I'm protecting myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say any stupid shit. No. You know, I'm not, you want me to say, I'm, you know, like I, yes. I'll protect myself. I'll be good in it. I'll be good in yeah, it. Yeah, that's the key. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully you guys go with the rest of it the way you thought it was so, you know, cherry. Yeah. You know, when you were uh, telling me, uh, uh, to go fuck myself with my suggestions. <laughs> you know, I want to ask you one story that I heard, and maybe it's told a million times, but I don't think Ryan's heard it. So let's do it for Quiet Ryan, who's here to your left. Quiet Ryan. Quiet Ryan. He's uh, always over there. He doesn't look inter interested. I know you're making notes. He's interested. But, yeah. I, I, Are you interested, Ryan? Yeah. 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 He is. <laughs> when, he doesn't have a microphone. When I watched, uh, he doesn't have a microphone. When I watched the podcast back, and I was making sure I didn't say the same thing. He just always over there, never looking at me. Just always just fucking like doing it, like like he's not part of it. You know. Oh, like, he, he is. You need to get him a mic. Well, I normally do. We we have this weird setup, so we have to get a mic, Ryan. We have to figure this out today. We're going to figure it out. Maybe is this the one that you asked how his therapy was going mm -hmm. last time I yeah. was here oh, yeah. and your therapy oh, and yeah. everything? How's your therapy going? I don't fucking go. I don't. I've you been to. I've, I've been therapy. to so many therapies. I, you know, my my son, uh, my wife and I were in in, in, in Bisbee about, about a month ago, and she said uh, ah, we were having dinner at some restaurant. And she said you're ADHD, adult ADHD. You know, I'm like I'm not. Are you? I'm not. I, I've been to. You know, 10 psychiatrists, I've been to like 30 therapists, I've been to like uh, doctors and AA meetings, and like nobody's ever said I'm ADHD. Did they ever say you were bipolar so, or anything? Nothing. Uh, no. So they, they, <laughs> they, 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 I've had some nice manic, uh, man, I've had manic, some manic episodes. Yeah, good, but they were fun. They were really well. Good. They're fun when they're on the highs, but when you hit low, uh, not so fun. I don't. I didn't get the low part. I was over in France, the George Sank. I don't know if you know that hotel over oh, there, boy. just spending money. I went over there and made, did something for a hundred thousand. By the time I left the George Sank, it was all gone. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> when was that? I don't know. You can look it up on my IMDb page. 25 oh it's when you know 25 years ago i was married to gina i don't think i i, I don't remember um uh, anyway let's go back to what the you, abyss i yeah. heard the story that ed harris almost died because he ran out of oxygen when he was swimming to one of those tanks or something there there was no oxygen and he barely made it is that true i don't know you never I heard mean, about that i've heard ed tell it uh, well when i say i don't know I, ed you can go online and listen to ed talk about exactly what happened to him. And I think more than anything else, there was a mix up underwater and a safety diver got to him and didn't put uh, the octopus in right into his mouth. And uh, he sucked up some, and it happened to Jim Cameron too. Um, there was a time when we were shooting, we had a 30 foot tank and uh, we're at the bottom and, and we don't, we, you know, we're not in scuba, scuba gear. We got these masks on. We got weights on our feet. And it's kind of like, you know, you're walking along. It's kind of like being on the moon. You can kind of bounce around. And it was fun. I, I really enjoyed that movie. I had a great time. The only time, the only thing that I didn't like about it was I wasn't always on the set. Right. You know, because I was playing the bad guy. So it was a lot of yeah. the others. But, but what about and, the boots? Stay with the boots. Story. Uh, oh, yeah. So so anyway, we're so so we're working. And, you know, they have lights underwater, however they figure that out. And, you know, we're working and we've been doing it for weeks and weeks and weeks at, and uh, working underwater and doing different stuff. And, and it's a huge tank, millions and millions and millions of gallons of water. And they put these beads on the top because the light was coming through and they, he, Jim wanted to be able to light it properly. So they put all these little tiny beads and it was all black on top. So no light would come in. And we're down there. And uh, we had an underwater uh, uh, oxygen tank that you just like, plug into and you get, you fill up your oxygen and then you, you know, then you're off and you're wandering around and until your shot's ready, you're bouncing around, you know, I used to, you know, I told you I was a wake and bake guy for 40 years right. or whatever, you know, and I, I, I had a blast. I had a great time, especially doing the underwater stuff. Um, but nothing happened. So what happened was like all of a sudden it just, everything went black, like all they lost all power 
Uh, oh, God. To, to, and there were five, four, three or four actors under there, the entire crew. But they all have scuba gear on. They have scuba. They could just, you, you know. You can't. They, no. No. And it, it, it went from, like, me talking to you to you, like, closing your eyes. I mean, that's. Scary. It, it was it was weird. Weird. I mean, I have oxygen, but the first my your first thought is, well, Liberals how much out. how much oxygen did I have? You know, and then as time goes by, it's like it's dark. I don't know where we are. I don't know how much oxygen I have. What the F is going on? So for Did you hear for, anything? For, no, of course not. Underwater? No. I thought maybe they had like little no, All right. they did. Well, Jim could talk to us, but no, nobody was communicating. How long were you there? I was, we were there for probably about two minutes. Which or seemed so. like eternity. It seemed like a long time. And then I thought to myself, Michael, you have a practical light on you. And a practical light is one that your character would use in a movie. They call it a practical light, right? So I'm like, oh my God, I've got my flashlight deal. So I pull that out, I turn that on. And people started just coming towards me, you know, because I was the only light underneath there after two minutes of people going, what the fuck? The safety divers. So who came to you? Them. All the actors? Everybody, all, every, everybody. Everybody who was down there came. And because they didn't have I was one? The only, nobody had one except for my practical light. And then Jim kind of rounded us all out and with hand signals and stuff said like, you know, follow me. We're going to go out this way. And uh, so like Jim Cameron to uh, the rescue, as always, he was the man. I mean, if you're ever in a foxhole, you want to be in a foxhole with that guy. And, uh, you know, nobody was expecting it. And it was scary. It was scary. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, wow, as dude. as Jim was leading the group and we're all we all held each other. We were all like lined up holding each other. And Jim was, you know, he knew you know, geographically where he was and how to get out. And uh, by the time, you know, 30 or 40 seconds of doing that, all of a sudden, everything, all the lights came back on again. So that was, that was a scary experience for me. That is uh, crazy. You know, uh, uh, Ed uh, had uh, an experience where I, get, I think he sucked up some water. Right. But what Ed Harris, who is, by the way, he was, he's kind of a real man's man kind of a guy he you know you know i'd go out running he'd be like hitting a speed you know he'd be hitting a bag you know i'd drive in in my mercedes he'd drive in in his truck i'd be smoking uh uh, uh marlboro lights he'd Reds. be smoking camels without without a <laughs> filter. filter you know he was he was that guy and he's a great actor yeah, and a one, uh, wonderful guy and i think that uh from what i've seen online or heard online is that uh or, or i've watched him talk about is he was disappointed in his own reaction to like a near-death experience he was disappointed in in himself the way that his brain went oh fuck i'm gonna die or, or whatever i'm not sure i don't want to put words right. in his mouth and that that more than anything else, you know, Jim Cameron has got an incredible record. When you think about the movies that he's done in yeah. water, the Terminator, all the fighting, all the car chases, all the shooting, all the Avatar, effects, all, all the, everything. everything blowing up uh, and aliens, things are blowing up, fire always all over the place. I don't, nobody's ever been heard on a Jim Cameron. Here's another story I'll tell you quickly, and then you can edit what you want to edit. Okay, so uh, Jim is, um, I'm, I'm working, I believe I was working on the Terminator with him at some point in the Terminator, and he's working on the set, and I, I noticed a difference about him. I noticed that he wasn't his, he wasn't himself. And he seemed a little bit distant as compared to the Jim Cameron who's in your face going, I want this and I want that. You got it? You got it? Okay, let's roll. Come, hi, is everybody ready? Come, all right, let's roll. You he know, was just... He's, there's something that seemed a little odd about him. And uh, at one point, it was in the morning, I think. At one point in the morning, I pulled him on. I said, Jim, are you okay? Are you all right? You seem... And he goes, I'm okay. And I said, are you sure? And he said, well... You know, Michael, I wrote a uh, script um, uh, for um, 
what's the uh, Stallone movie where he's out in the woods? He's Rambo. A, Rambo. Ram, he wrote he wrote Rambo too. And you know, I wrote a scene, and I just heard this morning or last night that uh, a stuntman was killed doing that scene oh. that I wrote. And uh, I, you know, I said, Jim, like, what, you know, it's you, not can't, your fault. you can't blame yourself for that. But, but he felt he, it. He felt it. And so people that think Jim Cameron is just this, like, filmmaking, uh, you know, like, you know, he, he's a, he he's a compassionate, caring person. Sometimes he doesn't have time to show it, but that's a perfect example of a thing that he was taking. Um, he was taking it on himself, and I said to him, like, and 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 had to say, Jim, like, you can't blame yourself for that. I'm not sure that that helped the situation, but, but he felt it. Uh, well, he 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 felt what happened to him. And it affected the way that he was, uh, uh, pr not performing, but the way that he was uh, working the next day. And I, I saw it, vis vis I knew him well enough at yeah. the time that I, next time I come back, I'll tell you the story about what happened on Aliens and how I got paid more for them to use my, they tried to use my image without my permission, and David Fincher, yep. who, basically says nobody hates that movie more than me and um but they tried to use my image without my permission and it, it it was a whole big deal they ended up paying me as much as i made for the movie to use a picture of me to kill me good off. good for you well there's and there's a whole story behind it well we're gonna right? save it okay man this has been All awesome right. did you have fun oh, i always have fun dude yeah, it's so sure. good yeah brian did you have fun i did yeah all right, all right. get him a microphone yeah <laughs> thanks mike yeah, you're welcome you know, he was worried. He was like, eh, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's going to be as good. They just had me on there. Do you, you know, you, I was just on your podcast. I go, well, it'll be a year. Yeah, you think people want to listen. I'm like, yeah, they do. So he came on, and I think he's, uh, I think this one, this is great. I think people are going to love this one because he's just so likable, and his stories are so freaking good, man. Thank you, Michael Beantree. Thank you, Michael Beanus. Thank you, Michael Bean there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> I always say I've been there, done that. Anyway, thanks. It was awesome. Um, and thanks for supporting the podcast, guys. This is a, a real treat. Again, if you want to give back to the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash inside you and join Patreon and give back and really help the podcast. And I'll try to write you a little note to thank you. And there's so many great perks. You get your names shouted out at the end of every episode, which we're about to do. What you're about to do. Woohoo. Yes, very exciting, Ryan. Very, I'm very exciting. Obviously stuff. excited. Yes. Um, any new shows you've been watching? New shows? Anything? I've been watching The Pacific. I know it's dated. Oh, that's an old one. I know, but I hadn't seen it, and it's pretty good. Yeah, that's the... you know, it's not as like engaging with like the characters that you really like. Sometimes I don't really recognize like who I'm following, and it was, it's a little bit all over. But it's cool. Uh huh. Uh, I just rewatched The Good Place. I love The Good Place. Yeah. Um. I don't know if that's for you though. But nah, that's probably not for me. I, you know, I, I watched it. an episode and I thought they were both charming as hell. It's cool. It's just not my kind of show, but I it's a good it. show. I'm sure it's a good show. I'm just really critical and I hate that about myself. I'm too critical. <laughs> but if I wasn't critical, then I'd probably just like, oh my gosh, NCI Albuquerque was unbelievable last night. There's one in Sydney now. Do you know that? There's not one in Albuquerque though, is there? Uh, no. Thank God, I just let him win. So well, NCI, well, it's naval based, so I don't think Albuquerque would do well with a naval show. It's a naval show. NCIS. I didn't know that. That's what it stands for. What Navy? Sis. <laughs> Navy <laughs> Corporation Intelligence. <laughs> Isn't Navy Intelligence crime uh, crime investigative services? No, I'm kidding. Navy. I don't know. Yeah, crime investigation. Who cares? Here we go. These are the top tier patrons. We're going to read out. These are people that give back to the podcast that I consider friends and I love you and thank you. Uh, Ryan can read with me. Okay. Nancy D. Sweet Nancy D. Leah and Kristen. Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E., Brian H., Nico P. How's Zach doing? I hope he's doing all right. Robert B, Jason W, Sophie M, Raj C, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Mike E, Eldon Supremo, 99 more, Santiago M, Leanne P. 
Maddie S, Belinda N, Dave H. Wait, wait. Dave H. It's Dave H. Hey, Michael. It's, it's Dave H. Dave H. Dave H Love it? Dave. <laughs> Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Talia M, Betsy D, Rhiannon C, Corey K. Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, yeah, Brandy D. <laughs> Brandy D, Eugene and Leah. I love you. Corey, Mel S, Christine S, Eric H, Shane R, Andrew M, Amanda R, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jarrell, Jam and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Mike F, Stonehenge, Brian L. Uh, Jules M, Kendall L, Jessica B, Kyle F, Marisol P, Kaylee J, Brian A, Mary and Louise L, Romeo the Band. Frank B, Jen T, Nikki L, April R, Randy S, J D W, Oral, Oral P, Oral B, Rachel D, Melissa H, Nick W, Stephanie and Evan, Charlene A, Don G, Jenny B, John, Jennifer R, Tina E, N G, Tracy, and Junie. Guys, I adore the crap out of you. Thank you so much. And, um, from the Hollywood Hills in California, I'm Michael Rosenbaum. I'm Ryan Tans. Little wave to the camera. Uh, we love you. Be good to yourself. All right? Be good to yourself.